satisfy your need for happiness through your own curiosity with the Ranveer Show. China. What's up? What's up with China? I mean, yeah, Mr. Xi Jinping is sitting pretty as, as the emperor of the, the current uh, dynasty. The current dynasty is the Chinese Communist Party. So in China, I mean, when, when historians talk about Chinese history, they talk about dynastic cycles. You have dynastic cycles everywhere in the world, but they talk about Chinese dynastic cycles. So you had various dynasties that rose and fell, rose and fell. Whenever a dynasty falls, it's typically because of a certain set of reasons, they call it the mandate of heaven. If you have the mandate of heaven, you stay in power. Once you lose the mandate of heaven, you fall from the grace of the gods and you lose power. The mandate of heaven is very simple, control. If you have the wherewithal to control your country and its people, you have the mandate of heaven. The moment you lose that, you're gone and your dynasty falls. So that's how empires rise and fall in China. And the current empire is the Chinese Communist Party. And they don't have hereditary emperors. They have emperors who are chosen by the current dispensation. So previously we had, who was it? We had Mr. Hu Jintao and then whoever it was. And then now we have Mr. Xi Jinping, who is the current emperor. And he has made himself essentially emperor for life, amended some of the rules and some of the constitution and all that. He's essentially an emperor for life. That's one, what one could say. As long as it lasts, he's emperor for life. Uh, as long as he lasts in power. So to stay in power, you have to be tough in China. And that's what Mr. Xi Jinping is doing. He is consolidating his power. He's, he has got rid of all the opposition, even imaginary opposition to himself. Lots of people have disappeared. What happened to Mr. Alibaba, Mr. Jack Ma? Where is he? We don't know. Uh, what happened to certain generals? What happened to their foreign minister? Disappeared from public life. One hopes they are somewhere. <laughs> Whatever, right? So that's how it is in China. Chinese politics is really, really tough. Dog-eat-dog -dog world. And, and So China, as we know, is an aspiring superpower. They aspire to replace and displace the U.S. as the preeminent global, global power by what, 2049, 2050, somewhere around that time. The 100th anniversary of the founding, not the founding, the, the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party taking over power in China, roughly around 2050. I, the date eludes me, my dear, reader, my dear viewers can look it up for themselves, right? So that's what it is. So the Chinese have built up this mega economy through manufacturing and this this entire process was aided and abetted and midwifed by the US. And this is known history. Now there is this big rivalry between the Chinese and the Americans. The Americans have gone all out in recognizing China as their number one threat. And there's something called the Thucydides trap, which we'll not go into. But when we have an existing power and there's a rising power, they say that war is inevitable, which is a lesson that was drawn from the Peloponnesian War almost two and a half thousand years ago in ancient Greece. And the writer was Thucydides, Okay, digression. Okay, so, so that's what it is. So China is this big power, but now they are facing challenges. They're facing challenges from the demographic perspective, from the economic perspective. The economy is slowing down. It's no longer galloping forward at 10% a year or 10% plus a year. Their figures say that it's around 5% something per year. But one has to take their figures with a few grains of salt. And then there is the demographic challenge, which is even bigger. The Chinese population, uh, the growth is slowing down. There's something called the TFR, total fertility rate. To sustain a population at the current population level, you need a TFR of 2.1 per woman, which means on average, though every woman should produce 2.1 children. On average. Obviously, nobody can produce 2.1 children, but on average, that should be the figure. If you fall below 2.1, your population is going to start declining. Not just that, it's going to start aging as well. Now, China has this weird, weird system that, that they enforce for a long time. The one-child policy. Chinese society is so stunted and weird. Think about this. Every Chinese person, take any Chinese person, he or she doesn't have any siblings, no brother, no sister, no cousins, no aunts, no uncles, no nieces, no nephews. It is such a strange society. And because of the one-child policy, which is now which has now been relaxed, but because of the policy, every family, every set of parents treats their children as their most valuable and precious possession in the world, and they don't want to risk anything with their career, their lives, anything, right? So it's very difficult to convince them to send the children in the army, in the military, especially on front lines. Very, very, you know that sort of thing. And the population is aging. Right now, the median age, the average age, I believe, is around 38 or something, if I'm not mistaken. By 2100, it could be in the 60s. The average age could be in the mid-60s. 
So imagine, and, and the population by 2100 is projected to be half of what it is today, about 700 million. Imagine a nation of 700 million people whose average age is 65. The average person on the streets or everywhere else is 65 years old. Who's gonna do everything? Okay, who's gonna provide the 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 uh, fighter fighter pilots? Who's gonna provide the soldiers on the front lines? Who's gonna do all the science? Who's gonna do all the industry, all the workers, all the laborers? Who's gonna do that? Obviously, one could argue that artificial intelligence and robotics will solve the problems, but who knows? Come on, man, it's all far off. We don't have that today. So these are the dem demographic and uh, ch other challenges China is facing. The economy isn't doing that well anymore. There are big bubbles. There's the property bubble. And there's lots of other things and all. There's There are big challenges in the banking system. Lots of debt has been given out. There are lots of empty mega cities that have been built. No one's living there. Lots of problems. But the Chinese are optimistic. The Chinese Communist Party is optimistic and can take the nation forward. But we have these big, well-known problems out there. Then there, there is the expansionist, hegemonic mindset of the Chinese Communist Party. They have territorial disputes with all of the neighbors. Name one neighbor that they don't have a territorial dispute with, and I'll wait. There's no one. Whether it's Japan, whether it's Taiwan, whether it is Kazakhstan, whether it is Russia, India, we all know. Bhutan, everybody, Afghanistan, they, they claim the Wakhan Corridor. They had these territorial disputes with Russia, okay? The Usuri River uh, region. So it's in the Russian Far East and the Chinese Far North. So there were these clashes in 1969. The Usuri River clashes. Hundreds of soldiers died on both sides. The two nations nearly went to war. The Russians had decided to nuke China. And it was the Americans under his, uh, Nixon and Kissinger who threatened them with retaliation. And that's how China was saved. So there was this boundary dispute, the large Usuri River boundary dispute that was resolved in the early 2000s. Now the Chinese have published a map last year, 23, in which they've reopened the border dispute and claimed certain of these territories as their own and they've also renamed certain regions in Russia to Chinese names. So the Chinese are playing the same old games they play with everybody, with Russia. Imagine this, today the world is looking at China and Russia as allies. I'll tell you what, they don't trust each other. The Russians don't, do not trust China. They have Iskander ballistic missiles on the border pointed at Chinese uh, targets and there would be missiles aimed at Beijing as well and vice versa. The Chinese will, I guarantee this, have missiles aimed at Moscow and other cities. Nuclear missiles, nuclear tipped missiles. So that is the situation. It's 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 a kind of uneasy uh, modus vivendi, one could say, um, an uneasy arrangement that they have right now. But they do not trust each other. The number one threat to Russia is China. And that's why the Russians are happy about India's rise. And happy about the fact that India is not buckling in and giving in to Chinese bullying and whatever attempts they are doing. So, and then the Chinese are playing games in the Indian subcontinent. They're trying to woo Bangladesh. It's not working a lot. They are trying to open ports in our neighboring country, Myanmar, Burma. Okay. So the Chinese are playing these games. They are trying to woo Nepal. Obviously, our wonderful government from the 1990s, whoever was in power then, they toppled the Hindu monarchy of Nepal, which was very pro-India. And they well, supported a civil war, a Maoist insurgency, Maoist civil war against the, the, the monarchy. The monarchy was toppled. We know what happened in the palace. Uh, horrible story. And then the Maoists took, took over. And today, most of the politics, most of the, the dominant politicians in Nepal are pro-China and anti-India. Many of them, not all, many of them. And so that's the deal. So the Chinese are trying to influence Nepal into being more and more of a satellite of China. Then they are bullying Bhutan into ceding territory to the, to the Chinese and uh, in and they will offer a negotiated settlement in which Bhutan has to kind of become more, more and more pro-China. Then the Chinese are trying to influence Afghanistan as well. We know the deal with Pakistan. The Chinese even have soldiers in Pakistan. In temporarily Pakistan occupied Kashmir, they are trying to woo Sri Lanka. They've done that. They've, they uh, imposed a debt trap on Sri Lanka when the Rajapaksas were in power. There is this dead port called, ha called Hammantota where nobody comes. There's an airport that, that, that nobody flies to. The Chinese have built that and taken the money and because the Sri Lankans were not able to repay the debt, the Chinese have taken that region, that, that, that land on a 99-year lease and so on. And there's the Maldives situation. Then there's a new Maldivian government in power which is pro-China. And Mr. Modi, Prime Minister Modi recently visited the Lakshadweep Islands and he did not speak out Maldives at, at all. And the Maldivians uh, threw a hissy fit uh, various elements in the Maldivian government and they criticized, they, were, they issued statements that were, that were critical of Mr. Modi for what reason? We have not spoken about you, but they went ahead and did that. And some of them even went ahead and uh, put out various anti-India and anti-Indians kind of sentiments. And the Maldives tourism industry has taken a big hit because of that. 
and the bilateral relationship has kind of obviously there's going to be consequences to such actions when it comes from members of the government so we have that so the maldives are kind of uh, the government is kind of right now kind of pro china so the chinese are playing these games they have that that belt and road initiative which was supposed to be the great vehicle that would propel china to superstardom to to superpower status it's not working out first of all uh, you know it's it's not many nations are pulling out of it recently e, uh, italy pulled out of it pulled out of the bri uh, there's the ukraine conflict going on because of which the bri infrastructure cannot be run through ukraine so it's kind of kind of not working right now um, i don't see it working in the long term they also had the maritime silk road even that is kind of dead in the water so this great chinese initiatives and dreams are not quite fructifying obviously they will try their best to revive this and make it work they have the what they call the string of pearls which is a, 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 you know a network an infrastructure building spree to to encircle india with with chinese ports you know with with chinese assets in pakistan in in in, in gwadar in uh, the maldives in sri lanka in burma and so on they also have a listening post in the coco islands just north of the andaman nicobar islands they have a port in djibouti which they operate and so on so the chinese are trying to encircle india at sea they're trying to encircle india in the himalayan region as well so the chinese games are continuing right but india is rising and as long as india manages this situation and ensures that we don't get embroiled in a major conflict military conflict with anyone next 20 years they're going to be unstoppable and the longer india goes and rises see india's growth is the largest in the world right now india is the only economy in the entire world that is not under any threat whatsoever of a recession hmm and india is rising it's growing at 6 plus 7 plus percent per year depending on the quarter and all that sometime hopefully will will exceed that hmm as india's economy keeps growing and india's uh, in, as your economy grows your military might also grows the longer it grows the more difficult it is for china to tangle with india because it is going to guarantee that they're going to get a bloody nose and they're going to lose some of their hard gained assets and all that so that's the situation right now uh, the chinese are well they would like to rise and they, they, you know they have these commentators on social media obviously they have banned twitter and google and whatever but they do use twitter and all that and twitter somehow allow, x x allows chinese diplomats to use the, the the platform freely and all that so there's a lot of chinese propaganda out there they portray the west as this evil hegemonic power which i would not totally disagree with i would actually mostly agree with that we know the history but they they try to portray india as an accomplice and an accessory to what the west is doing that's the kind of spin they are putting on india's foreign policy which could not be further from the truth and they said that india is anti china because of the west excuse me you are claiming our territory you've gone to war with us at least twice thrice 62 we lost 67 we beat china 87 we beat china again nobody talks about these you know these clashes and the chinese are claiming arunachal pradesh they have, they they occupy aksai chin they have their footprints over pok and they are calling us the aggressor so that's the spin the chinese always put so china is a problem for india if the chinese behave themselves it, everything would be good but it doesn't work it's not that's not been their attitude so when it comes to the india china issue there's only one solution the only long term solution is that tibet should be a free nation and the chinese involvement should in tibet should end now there is no threat of that happening anytime soon at least the next 20 years tibet is going to be under chinese occupation and we know they've changed the demographics in tibet the, the tibetan people are now a minority in their own land so that's a situation but the only way to ensure peace between india and china is for tibet to be free india and china have always had the best of relations extremely friendly relations india has been a net exporter of culture and civilization to china what is the chinese influence in india today nothing what's the indian influence in china it's everywhere all over the place especially historically right so india has been a giver of culture and civilization and learning and wisdom and knowledge to china and we have never attacked china and not in 2000 how old is china let's say 3000 years okay let's say it's 3 and a half thousand years if you want to be nice to them they have existed as a civilization for 3 and a half thousand years we have existed forever not once have we had a conflict india and china it's only after they captured tibet and we allowed that to happen mr nehru the great magnificent mr nehru made this happen so it's only after the 1950s that india and china have had a temporarily shared border and that's why we uh, 
two large powers obviously there's going to be conflict if we have a shared border so that's the situation long term we need tibet to be independent again and that's the only way we can have peace between india and china so china is a very big factor it's going to be a very major power at least till 2050 next two three decades definitely but it's a power in decline and so is the us actually uh, we spoke about three very important geopolitical events that are happening at the start of 2024 the ongoing russia ukraine conflict the conflict in the gulf and then the african uh, niger uh, coup that you spoke about at the start of this podcast mm-hmm. uh, which kind of affects the geopolitical power that france holds in that belt um uh, i remember in one of our older podcasts from last year or the year before that you spoke about how we're probably heading into a three pronged world like a three like three different teams multipolar world multipolar world yeah uh one pole would be russia and china mm-hmm. the other pole would be america nato etc mm-hmm. and the third pole is possibly a collaboration between india and france hmm so i'm beginning a whole new chapter here mm-hmm. beginning with what china's possible viewpoint is on these three conflicts which are important right mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. the gulf conflict the european conflict and uh the african situation right so the chinese have significant interest in africa they want to use africa as a place from the, which they get raw materials to fuel their economies you know copper iron coal rare earth minerals and so on and so forth they want all that raw in raw form they will then take to their country process and then turn into finished products so africa is just a, a place where they can get resources from that's how they see africa modern day colonialism you could say that but even the europeans and the uh, the, the west is doing the same thing hmm. maybe even worse you know hmm. in a much worse form perhaps so the the chinese view africa as that so there is this proxy conflict going on there between the east and the west china and russia on one side and france and the us and whatever else on the other side and then the poor of Af- the unfortunate african nations and the people are caught in the crossfire in between and they are their suffering is endless hmm. that is the deal with africa now when it comes to the middle east conflict the chinese obviously are taking the side of gaza and the palestinian people and they even have this like i said the port in djibouti which is in the horn of africa near the strait of bab al bandeb between the the red sea and the arabian sea that region they have a port there and they have warships there and they have been you know doing this these anti piracy patrols but when a ship is taken over by pirates the chinese just sit and watch they refuse to heed the distress calls they just sit and watch and the indians go in and rescue ships from pirates that's what that's the kind of role the chinese are playing there there's an element of mischief making there an element of you know glee that yeah look at the unf- the misfortune that's befalling you that's the role the chinese are playing which is no role at all just observers and not doing their duty as anti piracy operatives so that's the deal so when it comes to the middle east conflict the chinese are taking the side of uh, of the 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 hamas the hezbollah because they have ties like i said in big investments in iran the chinese have also made huge uh, trade deals with saudi arabia and probably even the uae because there's a lot of oil there and they would like to enjoy that they would they need that to fuel their economy and the saudis obviously are are happy to do business with whoever is willing to buy their oil so there is the element of that there and the saudis and the uae are now part of brics so is uh, ethiopia which is one could say a relatively minor power comparatively and there is egypt which is one of the major north african nations and well it's the bridge between asia and africa india has excellent relations with egypt now we talk about china so that's the chinese angle in the middle east region they are anti israel anti west pro iran pro hezbollah pro houthis pro pro hamas that's the deal and they are not doing their duty as anti piracy operators they're just sitting and watching that's what that's the thing when it comes to the war in europe the 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 uh, ukraine conflict the chinese are on the side of russia so the chinese covet the the plentiful gas that can flow out of russia russia has russia is what we call an autarky an autarky is a nation that has everything within its own territory doesn't need to import anything from anywhere the, the, the russians don't need to import iron ore they don't need to import bauxite the the ore of coal they don't need to import oil they don't need to import gas they don't uh, petrochemicals agriculture everything they have they don't need anything so russia is an autarky china is not so the chinese would like to 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 you know acquire this plentiful russian hydrocarbons gas oil all that whatever other minerals resources they have and they would like to turn russia into a client state a vassal state my favorite word vassal my viewers will know that so they would like to turn russia into a vassal state and russia needs a pressure release valve which probably is india 
if india can to some extent counterbalance china it's good for russia so the chinese are on the side of ukraine uh, um, some sorry chinese are, are on the side of mr putin in the ukraine war they're anti zelensky zelensky is well so ukraine is a proxy war between russia and the and nato nato is owned by the us so the americans wanted to turn this into a battle down and and destroy russia's fighting strength never happened in, instead of that R- ukraine got destroyed and well who knows how it it goes on one hopes the conflict ends sooner or later because it's been terrible for the people of ukraine they've lost all their men they've lost their young people and and so on yeah so that's the chinese involvement in europe they want obviously they had lots of designs and, and and great ambitions for europe they wanted to interlink europe and eurasia with china this great infrastructure network road rail all that shipping they even bought uh, you know ports in various parts of, of, of the mediterranean sea uh, in greece in 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 israel and so and so on but india has also bought ports in this regions so there's this thing also going on there so that's the chinese involvement in africa in the middle east and in europe overall um they still the manufacturing hub of the world they still are yes making money there so yeah so there is this uh, this initiative called china plus 1 so most of these nations that are uh, that use china as a manufacturing hub are now diversifying their options they want more options so they want china china is there but they want china plus 1 so they're looking at one more nation from where they can source their manufacturing that could be vietnam mm. that could be thailand that could be india that could be bangladesh whatever now it's a great opportunity for these nations especially for india mm. right so we we are taking certain initiatives in that direction and obviously there's the taiwan factor which we have not spoken about taiwan is this big uh, semiconductor manufacturing hub tsmc this major company which manufactures so much of the world semiconductors is based in taiwan the americans have ensured that there is a new t- major mega plant of tsmc in arizona one more is coming up in saxony i believe in germany so that will give them enough redundancy because they own germany the americans own germany germany by the way so once that is done once these two plants become fully operational taiwan loses whatever real importance it had and then even if the chinese try to invade it they can just the americans can make sure that everything is destroyed and chinese inherit nothing but wasteland yeah i was watching a documentary about the current situation in taiwan this is an election year for them yes they again yeah the party in power hmm. is anti china mm-hmm. the the opposition party is pro china mm-hmm. no one's able to predict who's going to be elected yes. uh, therefore the citizens are in a state of turmoil at least that's what was shown in the documentary and this could totally be western branding and pr because it is media at the end of the day and all media is twisted based on the emotion of human beings but either way what was shown in the documentary was that people in taiwan are preparing for war hmm. they're taking these classes hmm. for self defense and at least that's the message i'm sure that represents a sliver of truth if not the whole truth at least will we see another hot war based conflict in that part of the world there's always the possibility over there see recently mr xi went to the us he met with mr biden and apparently mr xi told mr biden that taiwan's reunification with china is inevitable it's going to happen one way or the other it could be peaceful reunification which they actually apparently desire or it could be reunification through other means which obviously means an actual ballistic uh, kinetic conflict let's look at the two scenarios the chinese have been squeezing taiwan so to say see the taiwan strait is a small narrow channel just like you could kind of compare it with the english channel the strait of water between british islands and europe kind of like that okay and the chinese have a major mega navy numerically the largest navy in the world and they always con- these days they they routinely conduct naval exercises all around taiwan they they have fighter planes fighter jets overfly taiwan all the time violate taiwanese airspace and all that it's it's become a routine matter now so they can if they want launch an invasion obviously the taiwanese defenses are very well prepared and the chinese would uh, have lots of casualties and they would lose a lot of assets and it's not easy it's not as easy as easy as it sounds but this this what this does is is it pressurizes the people of taiwan it it puts them under the siege mentality it lowers the morale of the people of taiwan it's always like constant pressure chinese military exercises chinese live firing exercises in, into taiwanese waters chinese fighter planes overfly taiwanese airspace sometimes even the island sometimes and there is this barrage of chinese language propaganda aimed at the taiwanese people 
and there is this interconnectivity between the two economies as well now you know there are lots of chinese companies in taiwan but the taiwanese are employed by chinese companies on the mainland and so on so the chinese are trying to you know do it by other means not through war but at the end of the day if all fails they may possibly perhaps go to war if they calculate that the the, the equations will work out in their favor obviously the americans would like to use that opportunity if the war actually happens to damage china as much as possible but who knows so i hope a hot war doesn't happen the chinese may be able to achieve their objectives without having to resort to war but that is a long small drawn out process if you enjoyed today's clip make sure you check out these curated playlists that we've made especially for you related to the subject that was spoken about in this clip